All right, let's do the questions. Okay, hi. Um, can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay, so the first question is from Luna, and okay. they're asking, I'm a parent volunteer at my child's school. We are hoping to develop an indigenous garden space, um, possibly a medicine wheel or a pollinator themed medicine wheel. And we wish to do this respectfully. How do, we, how do you suggest we get started? Well, first things first is seek out an indigenous gardener or indigenous agriculturalist who has knowledge on the medicine wheels and the, the foods you can, you can grow in your garden and start at that, start at that, start it that way. That's how you do it first. Seek out the knowledge keepers. They will, they will set you on the right path. At the, at the same time, seek out any other school that is doing the exact same thing as you. And, or you can also seek out green thumbs growing kids as well. They're doing that in gardens and schools. All right. Okay, next question. Um, which kind of soil contaminants do sunflowers remove? In particular, do they remove some of the heavy metals that can be found within urban soils, such as lead, et cetera? Which part of the sunflower stores the contaminants? Thank you. Okay, so your sunflowers will remove your leads. Um, I want to say it's chromium, but that's not a word. Um, but do, if there's any sort of radiation as well, because remember Chernobyl, uh, radiated soon of all right now to Ukraine. Sorry about hearing from Ukraine. But when that was growing, when it was after the radiation thing, they planted the sunflowers. Exactly. Ragweed is for heavy metal removers as well. Indian grass is for heavy, heavy metal removers. So when it comes to sunflowers, what happens is that they will take they will suck up the, the chemical the, um, heavy metals, uh, the lead, the cadmium, and they will store it the first two and a half feet, apparently, in their stock and in their leaves. That's where she stores it. So anything else above that is edible and you can use, and what's below that you can use. It's in that two and a half, the two and a half, I'll say two and a half, three feet that she stores that those chemicals, and that's what I use. That I not use, but I will put a put a put for the chemical for chemical waste for the gardens. Do not put it in your in your nice Melbourne farm group. That's cool. Next question. Okay. Um, next question. Can you give us the list of seasonal changes and when to plant? I think I need that more in depth. So list of the plants to plant in seasonal changes? Yeah. Um, ch I think it's Ched Chediken. Um, if you can just give more information, we'll be glad to answer it next, in the next round. Um, okay, I'm going to the next question then. Um, John asks, is, what's the mix of soil, compost, compost, etc., that you use for the mounds at Scarborough Campus um, Garden? Okay, so Scarborough Campus, um, I didn't have control over the soil that they brought in, so they had a triple mix. So it was compost, mulch, uh, sorry, compost, topsoil, and some sort of fertilizer. And we also had mushroom compost, mushroom compost as well. So I did. Jeez, I remember. I basically did half and half. So my mounds were three, sorry, three feet tall, four feet wide. And I just mixed, mixed about half and half as much, as much as I could of both those compounds together. One thing I want to do, one thing I would like to do differently this year is add a little bit more clay to the soil. Just kind of stick it a little bit, stick it together more. That's all. Next question is from Leslie. Um, they said, I don't mind sharing my squash and tomatoes with the squirrel families, but how can I save some for my family? <laughs> okay, so you could do, you can do, you can do sprays. You can leave, if you have any hair, human hair laying around. Some, some animals, squirrels don't like the smell of human hair. Um, one thing, in one th if you're outside and you don't mind having a cat around, maybe plant catnip to bring a cat around to your garden. Um, look, look at doing some, sometimes doing sprays on your, on your plants. So don't look at a dishwater spray, just water and dish soap. You kind of cover your plant, give, give it an off taste for that, but it'll actually help clean your plants. Um, and if you really want to, maybe plant them in their own garden where they can have to go play at. Next question. 
next question. Okay. Um, Sally asked, what are your thoughts on managing invasive, invasive species, e example, given garlic mustard? Well, garlic mustard, you have a few things with it. Since it's not going anywhere, you got to learn to live with it. So you're going to have to make your garlic mustard, garlic mustard pesto if you want to. Maybe you make garlic mustard greens with it, so learn how to eat it. Or if you have a, a compost or a vermicompost, and make sure you cut the flower heads off. At Brickworks, when, when it's garlic mustard, we collect it all, cut the flower heads off, and we'll make sure the flower heads will kind of boil it to make sure they're dead and put them in the compost. But the rest of the plant, we have, we have vermicomposters for that. We, we put it back to the worms. We use it that way. But with invasive species, we are now at the point in time where we have to learn how to live with them. They're not going anywhere. Let's learn how to live with them how, how, and learn how to not spread them around. That's all. Okay. Next question. Next question is from Sharon. Where did the soil for, for the mounds come from? I'm just guessing from the Scarborough example you yeah, gave. That I have no idea where that soil came from. That's, the soil was brought in from, I'll say, a landscaping company. Because, it's because of the soil that on, on ah, if I can speak, it'd be great. Because of the soil at the Scarborough Farm Campus is not the best soil, which is the reason why I decided to use a container bed and, and to show them how to do mound garden to grow above the soil. Okay, next question is from Suzanne. And what size clay pots would you use for, corn, for the corn? Okay, corn clay pots. I would actually use this side, which I think is maybe about a four to five inch size. So a six inch pot or bigger. Don't go, don't go past, don't go past a 10 inch pot for corn. When I'm doing mounds, what I would like to do, what I would like to do with the mounds is have this in the middle of the mound. So your clay pot's in the middle of the mound, and the mound goes all the way around it. Covers it, covers it. This is just sitting there. Put your water in here, it feeds the rest of the mound. So, <clears throat> So 10 to 12 inches. So this one right here, if I was putting this in the ground, right, this is a four to six inch, I'm going to say maybe a four or six inch pot. It's going to water. The water's going to come out maybe about eight inches apart from it. Eight inches apart. Sorry, my hands are all over the place on this. Okay. Next question is from Janina. Um, do you integrate any fruit trees in climate change gardening? Yes. So all about building a fruit, a food forest. So when it comes to climate change gardening for me, I grow more traditional fruit trees like pawpaw trees. I'm big on the pawpaw trees, bring those back in, choke cherries, you know, elderberry. I make sure I have those in my garden. The garden, the brickworks you see, this garden right here is lined with choke cherries, pawpaws, you name it, I got it growing there. That's one thing I'm doing this year at Brickworks is creating a indigenous food forest on the other side of that garden. So yes, use your, get your fruit trees out there, your nut trees out there. They're all part, they all help with, all help with climate change gardening. And one thing you know about pawpaw trees, you can actually, when it comes, people, when it comes to walnut trees and the chemical that they give off, most things cannot be planted by walnut trees, except pawpaw trees. Okay, um, next question is from Michelle. Um, or did I just read this? Where do you put the seeds or you put the pot after planting? Oh, so when it comes to the, clear, the terracotta pots, one thing you need to know about the terracotta, terracotta cannot survive our winters up here. So it will crack on you. You must take them out of the ground every fall and have a special place to put them. Look at them. Maybe they cracked, maybe you damaged them, fix them up to want to clean. Make sure you clean them before you put them away. So at Brickworks, I have my own space where I put my terracotta pots. Okay. Matthew asks, um, how does climate change gardening relate to how we can be sustainable citizens? Climate, it relates a lot because it is forcing us to rethink the way we have been gardening for the past 400 years. How we've been gardening since, gardening since the settlers came here, the colonists came here. So now we have to rethink. So rethinking is going back to learning how to add more shade to our gardens, learning how to use more native plants in our gardens that will survive, um, and learning how to companion plant, right? 
I'm not, I'm not just saying complain plant with native, with native species. I mean, maybe you have a plant that you want in your own container garden from your own country you want to plant. No, put it stuff like that. It's also being, being aware of what we are actually planting as well. When it comes to invasive species, I always tell people, if you're going to plant, if you're going to plant something from that's not known here, put it in a container. Put it in a container. Don't put it in the ground, put it in a container. And when you don't have that plant, maybe pass it on to someone else. Don't put it outside, right? Because a lot of invasive species plants have started that way. They put them in a garden, they blew a seed somewhere, and they take it over. So we have to we have to take into account of that as well and pay attention to what we're actually planting in the soil and planting in our backyards. It all full circle, it all works together. Next question. Um, Sterling asks, as someone navigating a fair amount of poison ivy, any tips or info you can share about planting around it or living with it? I know it's a food <laughs> source for many. Oh, poison ivy. I will say this. Make sure you have jewel weed growing near your garden. Once again, make sure you have jewel weed, J-E-W-E-L, weed, W-E-E-D, growing near your garden, because that is your antidote to the poison ivy. If you're going to get rid of your poison ivy, I suggest this. I suggest that when it comes to fall time, when all this energy, all this medicine is going back down to the roots, that's when you got to pick the Take the poison out of your garden. And you, that means that get some gloves on, get a gas mask on, get to your garden and start digging. And get down there and start digging out those roots. Don't leave any root left behind or else it's going to grow back again. And when you, dis, when you get rid of those roots, it could be hazardous waste roots or put it somewhere else. Do not put it, do not put it in your compost bin and do not give it to the city to put in their compost bins. Or all you're doing is spreading those roots around. An inter interesting note about poison ivy, Traditionally, when a poison ivy started, energy started going back to its roots, the roots would be taken out, and that root would actually be placed on people's skin to make, basically burn them to make tattoos. I don't want okay. to do that because me and poison ivy are not friends. <laughs> um, Sandra asks, um, where did you get the Peruvian tomato seeds? Um, I would love to get some of them for our seed exchange in Greenest City. Oh. I got those from a medicine keeper years ago. Um, what you can do, if I can find a way of getting a hold of you, I can probably give you, see if I have any extra seedlings left over for you. It's all about sharing. Okay, I, um, I think this is a continuation from the, one of the first questions we uh, um, where they ask, can you use, can you give us the list of seasonal changes and when to plant? And they gave an example, when the carcass appears, what do you, what do you plant? You suggested several of these events. Ah, okay. <laughs> so it's back to phrenology. Okay. Quick before we, before we run out, I will leave my contact information if people want to get a hold of me as well with Tug, with Rhonda, with Chinu. And I think there's a lot of questions for me. So in my, my book that I have here, before we get cut off very quick, you're welcome. You're very welcome. Um, so crocus bloom when? Early spring, right? So early spring, you're gonna grow what? Put your, 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 your cool weather crops in. Arugula, do your broad beans, you do Chinese cabbage, you can do, there's all things you can start, start growing, right? Maybe inside the greenhouse, maybe do a cold frame or as I like to do sometimes experiment, just take them to this direct soil, this direct soil and see what happens, right? So, so when the crocus is in bloom, at the same time as when the tree bud starts to swell, so that's you know, early, early spring. Um, daffodils, the daffodils for, for cilia blooming, that's like mid spring, okay? Um, you can go to apples, cherries, strawberries in bloom are just past blooming, that's early summer, okay? I, it's 11.30. It's 11.30. Oh, my goodness. All right. So if people have any more information, what they can do is find a way to get a hold of me, and I will answer my emails or maybe go through to Tug or Chimu or whoever else is online here, and I will get back to you with the emails. I want to thank you, thank you, thank you, Chim and Gwich, for you guys spending this time with me to learn about my people's history and how we take care of the land that we are on and our our fight, our right, our fight, fight for our rights, um, our journey to 
our journey to getting our land to our, our land back. Awesome, I like that. Thank you so much, Isaac. It's been a pleasure. And uh, thank you for spending all of this time uh, with us.